Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living, where we are studying the gospel according to John. And we are looking today at chapter 12, just a few verses, looking at 9 through 11. Now, previously we examined the anointing of Jesus by Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, noting that she anointed his head and his feet. And what a scene that is to see. The anointed one, that is, the Messiah and the Christ, which means the anointed one, being anointed, right? It's amazing. Now, here we had the Lamb of God himself being anointed for the Passover of Passovers, right? The fulfillment of all Passovers since the beginning of history because the Passover was given to them long ago by God to point them to this very moment when the real Lamb of God comes down from heaven to be sacrificed. And we saw how that fragrant oil with which he was anointed filled the house, right? Just as the glory of God filled the tabernacle with which Moses and the Israelites took with them as they traveled throughout the wilderness. Do you remember back then uh, when they built the tabernacle according to the way God instructed Moses? And uh, we can look at chapter 40, verses 33 and 34 very quickly here. And uh, it says, And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screen of the court. So Moses finished the work, right? He finished all that the Lord told him about how to build and set up the tabernacle and the uh, gate and the, the court uh, that within the gates. Uh, and this tabernacle, they would um, assemble and then disassemble and pick it up and carry it with them throughout the Old Testament, throughout the wilderness, right? And so Moses here finished it, right? And then after they finished building the tabernacle, look what you read in verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You see that? It filled the tabernacle. We also saw this just as the glory of God filled the temple that King Solomon built for the Lord, which we saw in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 11, right? And the relevance of this is so important because just as the tabernacle was a temporary kind of tent that they would set up, and that would be where God's presence would be among them, like a house for God among them, so is the temple is an identical although much bigger and more glorious permanent building that they built uh, with the tabernacle in mind to be the, a, a permanent house among them where the glory of God would be present. And so when we read in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 11, after Solomon uh, brought in the Ark of the Covenant into the, the, basically the temple that they built, we read the following. So that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So you see, here in the temple of Solomon, after they built it and brought the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God came into it, just like the presence of God entered into the tabernacle in the Old Testament before uh, the days of the kings. And Moses had finished building that tabernacle. The Lord came inside, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. So both in the tabernacle and then in the temple that Solomon built. And then even more, we read in Acts, and we looked at these verses before. We look at Acts chapter 2. The first two verses tell us in the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. See that? It filled the whole house where they were sitting. See that? And that was the Holy Spirit that fell upon them, came down from heaven as the Lord Jesus promised. And that is the glory of God among them. See the glory of God filling 
the house. You see that? So important. And, um, and you know, we just the same, just the same as all those iterations, all those ways that we saw the glory of God filling the house, just the same we saw with the aroma of the fragrant oil here that uh, Mary used to anoint the Lord, that it filled the room, it filled the whole house just like the glory of God. You see, because Jesus himself is the glory of God, and the scent of the oil upon him diffused throughout the room, proclaiming his glory. You see, and truly, the glory of God fills every house that he comes into. And that's why we always ask the Lord to come and enter our home and make his home with us. Did you know that the Lord promised that he would do this if we ask, if we abide by him, that he would actually come into our home, him and the Father, right? Him and the Father. We can take a look. We can take a look right at John chapter 14, which we'll get to at some point here soon when we continue our study. But John chapter 14, verse 23 through 24, we read the following. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You see? He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So you see, this is not about when he takes us to be with him where he is, which will happen, but this is about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit coming to make their home with us here, right? Really and truly being present with us in our homes. And that promise is for anyone who loves the Lord Jesus and keeps his word as it's written here. Because when we keep his word, we are also keeping the Father's word because Jesus says that his words are the Father's words, right? It's just amazing, and it's just so real, you know? And too often we don't realize the value and the blessing in this, so something just we should be aware of. Now that brings us to our passage here today. We're going to jump right in, okay? We're going to jump right in with verse 9. So let's do this. So in verse 9 we read the following. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, that he, being Jesus, was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, if we recall that after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, we were told that many believed. And so here, we see that word got out, and lots of people came to find him on account of what they heard. In fact, the words used here was a great many of the Jews, you see? So to put it into context of what we know so far, this isn't the first or second or even third time that many of these people heard of Jesus and the miracles that he had done, right? Remember the multitudes that were in the thousands, right? Five to ten thousands who gathered around him uh, when he spoke and when he fed them? Remember the different times when he went to the temple during the feasts and when he taught many, many people among them? All the miracles he did that were really no secret. He did them publicly. And surely, lots of these people who are coming now to see him are not hearing of him for the first time. In fact, by now, a lot of the people who are rushing over to where he is were probably on the fence about him, meaning They had not yet formed an opinion about him, but were just curious about all his great works. And so when this news got out and they heard it, I bet many of them said to themselves, that's it. This Jesus is fulfilling so many things and is doing things we've never seen anyone do. And these people want to believe, but hadn't been fully uh, prepared to believe, right? They hadn't fully believed previously. And so when they heard this, it's like nothing else mattered anymore, right? They just needed to go and see it. 
But let's also point out one thing to be clear. We knew that there were spies among the crowd. Remember that? We know it. We know it because we read about it, and we read also passages that showed that these Pharisees do, in fact, send out spies among them. Remember? So we know it. And after Lazarus was raised from the dead, we read that while many believed at the time, there were those instead who ran off to the Pharisees to report what they saw. And so let's not be surprised about a suggestion that among the many who are coming here, that we read about in verse 9 here, among them are more spies and wicked people who are just there on behalf of the Pharisees who want to capture Jesus to put him to death. Note also, note also that they didn't come just for Jesus, but it says here that they came also that they might see Lazarus, and particularly to witness for themselves that he is in fact alive, and to check out the news that they heard, whether it was true, right? So we'll look at verses 10 and 11. But, hold on, get everything back on the screen here. Okay. 10 and 11, but the chief priests, here we have another but. Remember, whenever you see but, you better know there is a comparison being made. There's something that stands out here that we have to look at. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, okay? Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. You see that? So our suggestion from the prior verse that a number of those who came out to verify the news about Lazarus did that a lot of them did not come with good intentions but were rather sent by the Pharisees to verify the news that they heard and to keep watch on Jesus and Lazarus uh, that you see this is very likely the case right it's very likely the case that um, a lot of them who are coming here, okay, don't have a good intention. They're here um, representing the Pharisees, keeping an eye and a watch on them. In fact, we read here that the chief priests plotted, okay, look at that, they plotted to put Lazarus to death also, okay? Well, isn't that something? And keep, your, keep in your mind this notion about plotting, okay? plotting. It's such a dark thing. It's a kind of wickedness that thinks itself to be hidden in the deep, dark places deep inside of us. Plotting, planning. You see, that's what we read here about the chief priests and the Pharisees doing. And by the way, something we should be careful we never do, even on such a small scale that we think it not to be significant, uh, but more on that later toward the end of this discussion. But here, note, here they have already, already plotted, plotted already to kill Lazarus. They've already done it. They've already plotted. They've already made their plans to kill Lazarus. Isn't that something? As it seems, anyone who comes and demonstrates the power of God, miracles, the works of God, or the words of God, or preparing the way for the Lord. I mean, we just keep reading that the religious leaders just want to take them and kill them, right? They hated John the Baptist. They hated Jesus and do hate him now. And here, we see that they clearly hate Lazarus because in him, the power and the glory of God is seen. And it wasn't just seen, but it was seen at the hand of Jesus. You see, it's like they just want to kill everyone in whom the power of God is seen. Why? Well, we discussed that one many times, but it's clear that the Pharisees would rather that these great things were done by their own hands. You see, they're jealous. They'd rather these things were done by them and by their own hands, but they aren't. So, there's a lot of envy and jealousy, you see. No logic thinking at all. No logic. Their mentality is, 
We are your anointed leaders and we are the ones who tell you what to do and what to believe. You see? And anything that threatens that mentality of theirs becomes their enemy. While the rest of the logical world is astonished by the words that Jesus spoke and the many miracles that he did, which pointed to God the Father working through him. Not the case with the religious leaders here. And note that they have already plotted to put Lazarus to death also. This means that they are not just fantasizing about it. It means that they actually already gathered together and came up with a plan to kill him. See? They don't, they're not just going to try to kill Jesus. Now they're going to try to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Okay? Think about this for a second. What did Lazarus do exactly? Did he go around spreading false news? Did he go around traveling and even preaching? Lazarus was just raised from the dead. What evil could he have done that the Pharisees already made a plan to kill him? Okay? Don't miss that because when you think about this, you will then see clearly what we have just discussed, that the Pharisees don't care about anything other than getting rid of anyone in whom the power of God is manifest to all the people. Any logical person would see that Lazarus is a living proof of Jesus Christ being whom he says that he is. Okay, That is, God the Son. And that God is presently with them and among them. But there is no logic with the religious leaders. You see, it's their way or the highway. No logic at all, just envy and jealousy and hunger for power and authority. That's it. That is it. And verse 11 proves it once more because if you read there, it says that it was because it was on account of Lazarus that many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. That's why they wanted to kill him. That's why. And by the way, that's often why many people who believe in Jesus Christ are often persecuted. Not because they did anything wrong, but because they in themselves are a witness to the glory of God. Okay? And they bring many others to believe in the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth in the gospel. And so they become targets of persecution, and many of them become martyrs. Truly, you can see the power of the devil at work in all of this. And that's why, by the way, Jesus said to them earlier that they are of their father, the devil. Remember that? And here, they want to kill Lazarus for the same reason. Not because he committed some kind of crime, but because his rising back to life caused people to believe in Jesus. So, they would rather that he be put back to death. See that? They'd rather that Lazarus be put back to death. You see that? Lazarus was raised from the dead, and then people believed. So, the Pharisees want to kill him to make him dead again. Why? Well, because they hate that the people believed in Jesus because of what happened to him, Lazarus. As long as Lazarus is alive, he's a living testimony of the power of God in Jesus and the truth of who Jesus is. You see, Lazarus is then a living and walking testimony that nobody can escape. You see, if they quickly kill Lazarus, which they seem to have already planned to do, then they can spread rumors that Lazarus was never raised from the dead. And by it, they can claim that what the people heard was just rumors, and that therefore Jesus is not really whom everyone thinks he is. They can claim that he's a deceiver, just like they did before. They'll say, you know, Basically, if Lazarus is dead, then to them, it will be like none of this ever happened. You see? Problem solved. And you see, they have a problem. They came up with a solution. If Lazarus is dead, then to them, it will be like none of this ever happened. Then they can go back to enjoying their supremacy and authority over the people. Right? 
Don't believe that? Well then, what do you think they did when Jesus later died and arose from the dead? As you will see when we get there. They will pay off the soldiers to say that the body of Jesus was stolen from the tomb by his followers. Yep, that really happened. You see? Now, do you see a pattern here? One dies, then rises from the dead. Then the chief priests and Pharisees panic, and then they try to hide all the evidence of the resurrection that occurred. See that? See, that's called a pattern right there. That's called a pattern. See, that's what they're doing to Lazarus here. If we can get rid of Lazarus, we can kill him. We can say, oh, see, he remains dead, and there was no resurrection, and that all their problems go away. You see, that's what this is. This is a pattern, of this habit of theirs of plotting, planning in this dark area in their hearts about how to solve their own problems so that they can continue in their position of power and authority. It's called a pattern. It's also called evidence against the evil intentions in their hearts. Okay, The evil intention in the hearts of these religious leaders. And I would add one more thing here that I'd seen pointed out, and it's so true. Pay attention. This is is so important. And uh, if you've been following uh, our study here in chapter 11 and 12 so far, you're going to find this just to be something that's so amazing and so worth noting. Remember in chapter 11, Verse 49 through 52. Let me just, you know what, uh, bear with me here for one second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us back there. 49 through 52. Let me just read this real quick. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now, this he did this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Do you remember when we discussed this? If you, if you don't remember, you really, really, really need to go back and join that discussion. Very important, okay? And you'll see how, how this plays in here. And this, by the way, is it also another testimony of how everything, all the understanding that we obtain through the gospel is obtained sequentially, such that we had to understand chapter 11 well in order for us to to have a better understanding of chapter 12. It's all on purpose. It's not a coincidence, okay? Now, okay, in this chat, in these verses here, back in chapter 11, when we discussed this about how Caiaphas was intending to say that by killing only one man, of which he's referring to the killing Jesus, that by killing one man, they would save a whole nation. And his reasoning was that the nation may fall and be lost because of following a deception. And that this justifies killing Jesus in order to save the whole nation from that deception. See, that was how he reasoned about it. But in his heart, really, he was just trying to explain away to the people any reason to kill him. Because he wanted to get rid of him for the sake of their greedy Pharisee power and authority. Now, We know God actually allowed him to say this because the alternate meaning is true. That is, Jesus Christ himself, okay, and him alone would in fact die for the entire world, that all who believe in him would be saved and have eternal life. You see, the true meaning of what was said as per what God intended, not what Caiaphas intended, okay? Now, why do I bring this up? Okay, because isn't it odd then? You really got to follow me here. This is so, so interesting and so true. Isn't it odd then how suddenly they want two people to die? You see, whereas their excuse before Caiaphas here was claiming that one should die for the sake of the nation. 
Now they added a second, that is Lazarus. Isn't that a demonstration here that what Caiaphas was actually uh, doing, that what Caiaphas actually meant by what he said was not sincere, nor did it have anything to do with what is at the heart of the gospel. You see, since now they are extending indirectly here that two people should die for the sake of the nation since they added on Lazarus. So don't miss that point, okay? And this is proof that God allowed Caiaphas to say those words not for the meaning that Caiaphas intended, but because God allowed Caiaphas to pass those words through his lips as a prophecy about Jesus as it pertains to the gospel and only about the gospel. Though Caiaphas, okay, though Caiaphas did it unknowingly, okay, that just shows you how wonderful it is that God has full power and control over everyone's actions, even to the point that the wicked can utter something, the wicked person can utter something from their mouth, and the God can use it for his own good purposes. You see? But I just want to show you here, because whereas Caiaphas was trying to use the excuse that one man should die for all the people rather than they follow a deception and and the nation perish because of it. You see, here, he's adding on Lazarus. Now, Lazarus and Jesus, according to them, should die. And so, we know that what Caiaphas said before then is nothing but deception from his own heart, right? That was not his intention, to speak on the gospel. And so that point, I think, is made clear. But I think it's just amazing to see how all these evidences arise. They pop up through the gospel, you see? All these evidences arise through the gospel. It's amazing. And so finally, let me bring uh, bring us back to our passage here. Bear with me. Okay. Back to our passage. Now, Finally here, remember how we noted that the raising of Lazarus from the dead was part of this transition point in the gospel, which brought the focus on the general resurrection and, of course, on the Lord's resurrection? How much more now do we see that the resurrection of Lazarus is a miracle that shadows the Lord's resurrection, which will occur in just days from now. See that? See, let's compare them. Okay? Let's compare them. First, they, they, um, those close to Lazarus mourned for him, right? Before Lazarus died, those who were close to him were mourning for him, and they felt helpless when they saw him suffering illness, even unto his death. Also, on the other hand, those who followed Jesus closely, his disciples, for example, were mourning and distressed on account for what they saw Jesus suffering, and they felt helpless, not having any resurrection in their mind, even to the point of his death on the cross, right? See that? See that? how that lines up? Then we see here that the body of Lazarus was laid in a tomb, just like the Lord's body, was laid in a tomb. We see that Lazarus' tomb was covered with a large stone that had to be rolled away just like the Lord's tomb had a large uh, stone covering the entrance that had to be rolled away. We see that in both cases, sufficient time passes while they're in the tomb demonstrating that they were indeed not alive. Okay? A command in both cases is given for the stone to be rolled away. Okay? And in both cases, both Jesus and Lazarus come out of the tomb after their resurrection and appear to those whom they love. And even in the case of Lazarus and in Jesus, in both cases, the religious leaders are furious with the resurrection that occurred and they try to cover it up as if it never happened. You see? And it just goes deeper and deeper when you study it and spend time with the Lord, and He reveals it to you. So, you know, I'll give you another example here. There's something really interesting. We talked one time about how 
the Hebrew name for Jesus, Yeshua, uh, lined up with Joshua in the Old Testament, uh, whose name was Yehoshua before it was changed to Joshua, right? And Yehoshua, uh, um, the name Yehoshua, had the same meaning as uh, as uh, Yeshua because Yeshua came from the root word, the root name of Yehoshua, and it showed how Jesus and Joshua, uh, their names were Id- I- pretty much identical, and that was when we were talking about how Joshua was a type and shadow of Jesus who was to come. So understanding the names was really important, okay? And so, you know, w- here's the thing. For example, you know that the name Lazarus, okay, the name Lazarus here derives from the Hebrew name Eleazar, okay, and Eleazar, by the way, <clears throat> was an important priest in the Old Testament. Eleazar, okay, the name Eleazar is broken down to El, which means God, and Azar, which means to help, okay, the root meaning to help. And so the name Eleazar or Lazar or what came later, Lazarus, okay, means God is my helper, okay? Now, at the same time, the name Jesus, okay, which in Hebrew is known as Yeshua, is derived from the name Yehoshua, which we talked about when we discussed him compared to Joshua, okay? And the name Yehoshua, from which the name Jesus is derived, means God is my Savior or God is my Deliverer, you see? the similarity between the meaning of the names. See that? So, Lazarus means God is my helper. And Jesus, or Yeshua, means God is my Savior, or God is my Deliverer. You see the similarity in the meaning of the names of Lazarus and Jesus? Now, of course, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God, right? And so, but what we see here in the names is that even the names of those who we come across throughout the gospel, throughout the Bible even, anywhere throughout the Bible, the names themselves have these types and shadows built into them, you see, which also kind of strengthen our understanding that what we're reading about is in fact a type and shadow of something dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. But everything in this passage is just so packed with meaning, and I think that has to become quite clear at this point, right? Now, um, here's the thing. I think when we're looking, uh, in terms of verses, I think we're going to keep it short and leave it at here today, and we'll probably pick up with verse 12 on the next one. But I think, you know, I think that my favorite understanding from this passage today is that we should be cautious to evaluate our own intentions. We should be careful, okay, Think about this and, and just pause for a second and, and bear with me here. Just think, think on this with me, okay? We should be careful lest we have something in our own hearts and our own minds that we insist on so much that we begin to ignore everything else. Lest we start to tell others lies in order to justify our intentions so that we can get what we want, okay? Okay? Sometimes a person can go so far as to even try and make themselves believe their own lies, to try and justify even to themselves that what they desire and what they intend is justified, though it isn't. And the means by which they're trying to justify it and to obtain it as if it's justified, though it is not. You see, when we reach that point, We are led by our own selfish, deceiving hearts. No more logic. Okay? No more faith. Not even. Instead, we're we're following our own flesh, our own selfishness, our own deceiving hearts. We should know that this is possible and can happen to us. We talk about it uh, as in the form of plotting, right? When we think about how the Pharisees and chief priests plot in their hearts and in their minds against uh, the Lord and against uh, all those who, in whom the glory of God is seen, they plot against them. 
only to have their ways, you see, for their own selfish reasons. But we forget this can happen to us. It can happen to us. We should know that it is possible to happen to us. And we ought to stop and consider our behavior, our thoughts, and our intentions. Okay? And it's not just our things that we plan and plot. It's not necessarily that we do these things against the Lord, but we could do these things against others. And the Lord said what we do to others is as though we do unto him. You see, we can't fool him. You see, the Lord watches. He's got a close eye on us. And we should stop and consider our behavior, thoughts, and our intentions. And we should do it in prayer as we sit with the Lord, allowing him to reveal. Catch me here. Allowing the Lord to reveal to us our true intentions and allowing him to reveal what is truly in our hearts. Because many times, what we think and what he reveals to us are not the same thing. Okay? And I would suggest to you that the Lord is always right 100% of the time. So take some time today and sit in a quiet place and think about all the significant things that you said, that you planned, and intended this past week and the coming week, and take it to the Lord, but do it humbly and with an understanding that the Lord just might expose things for you, okay? And he might reveal things to you. But you have to know that the purpose of him revealing things to you is so that you would quickly repent and that you would quickly align yourself with what the Lord would desire for you. And quickly, okay, quickly, before you stumble and before you cause others to stumble on account of it. You see, because it's never too late until it's too late. Let none of us become so proud. Catch, you know, follow me here. This is so important. Let none of us become so proud and so confident in ourselves, thinking that we are not capable of lying to ourselves and to others just to get what we want, plotting, that we're not capable of plotting just like This discussion is titled today, Plotting. Plotting, by the way, doesn't have to always be on the grand scale that we saw today in the scriptures. But it can also be on a small scale, something we planned in our mind and our heart that we thought is too small that the Lord isn't looking down at it. See, small things in our heart, you know, Involving others around us and things we desire and things we insist on. and Little things that we plan out ahead in our minds in order to get our way. You see? Think about that for a second. Okay, my friends, that is called plotting. And in the eyes of God, it is called plotting. Now, to you and I, sometimes it may seem small enough in our own eyes, okay, that we might play it down as if it's not a big deal, though it's amplified in the eyes of God. It's huge. You see, that, my friends, is true deception. That, my friends, is true darkness. I don't know if you understand what it means these days for things to be dark. True evil that can be inside of our hearts. So I will say it again, that we should humble ourselves this day, taking the understanding of the gospel and the great things that the Holy Spirit reveals to us through it, And allow the Spirit of God to guide us in applying these things in our lives and in our homes. And for now, I'm just going to leave it at that. Wishing you a blessed weekend. Until the next one.